What is up, everybody? Welcome to the October 2023 YouTube live show. It's always funny. I'm always so uh, so surprised. Like, yeah, I guess it is October already. But here we are. A little bit early, like usual. I uh, like to make sure that the audio is working, make sure that everybody gets their notifications so they don't miss out on like the first few corals and all that. Um, we got a ton of news here, I guess. Not a lot different. Projects like normal. Um, it's kind of nice to not have gigantic projects, but it's a lot of smaller things happening. So this coming week is the one that we're expecting a lot of new things arriving. Not some coral maybe, but really a lot of like heavy equipment type stuff. A couple of which are new protein skimmers from MRC. Very excited about that. Those should be coming here on Wednesday. And it'll probably take us like a few weeks to probably get those installed. It's they're they're not small skimmers by any stretch. So they're it's it's gonna be a little involved to make sure all the plumbing um is exactly how we want it for that. Um what else is going on? I am working on a little bit more stuff in the studio space here. This studio has has come along really nicely and it's acoustically dead. I mean I, I love it for that. But visually, it's been a little bit of a mess because a lot of it is built around um, what I would just call like hand-me-down type stuff. We had purchased all sorts of things from like the university, like used uh, overstock selection, which was great to get started because you could get folding tables for like $5. I got a desk for like $10, $15. Um, but a lot of that is just kind of like really old, probably from like the eighties, um, and just mismatched stuff. So slowly as, um, a, a lot of the bigger projects are getting done, we can kind of slowly start to upgrade and get off of some of these like really just old hand-me-down pieces. So yeah, a lot of the folding tables beauty of that is that they fold up and we can just stuff them into one of the barns and it's no big deal. They'll, they'll be handy later, right? But for day-to-day -day stuff, we, we ended up getting some, some new furniture here. And next week, we're getting some pretty cool pieces. I'm putting together an actual set that I can sit with guests at and have it look halfway decent on camera. I wish we had something like that when Reef Builders was over so I could talk to Raj and Remy in something that wasn't a folding table. But uh, yeah, these things take time. And that time is next week. All right. Anyway, hope you guys are having a good weekend so far. The only thing that I have really to look forward to is I want to watch some college football later today. Luckily, the schedulers are working with me on this one <laughs> so that the game I'm interested in is in the evening after this broadcast. So as opposed to like a couple weeks there where it's like, oh, it starts at 11. So it's, I missed the entire game. Okay. So let me do a little bit of shuffling around here. I'm going to pop out the chat, going to live chat. Right. Real quick, since um, we've got a little bit of time to kill, I want to say some thank yous real fast. So first off, thank you to the two corporate sponsors, Ecotech Marine and Polyplab. And then we will go to uh, the crowdsourced stuff. So let's go to Patreon first. We have thank yous going out to Elaine Martinassi, Alan Jackson, Ann Lewis, Brandy Camp, Chuck Admire. Ernie Wallace, Greg, Greg Zimmerman, Harkins Aquatics, Jeremy Altman, aka Two Please, Jordan Marty, Keith Singer, Kyle Jamison, Lisa Clow, Lacree Fine Art, Lynn Holt, 
Puddle Aquatics, Ryan Baker, Scott Williams, Skylar Korn, Sue Hemmons, Thomas Tarrant, and Tim Garner. And on the YouTube member side, we have Cvin13, Mike Downey, Keith Holland, Terry Kuhn, Stories Reef, Herb777, Justin Harden, and Ohio Adventures. So thank you all very much. On today's show, we have, it's, it's not as many as some of them. I think that it's still in the same ballpark. It's over 200. I think it's like about 230 something, 240, something in that ballpark. So that should take us roughly to, I don't know, 430-ish Eastern. Mizu is up on LSU. Yeah, there's a couple of scores early that were um, that were a little bit sketch. I know that Ohio State was down early, but they've tied it up, and then they made like a really like so Maryland made like a really bad call, and so I don't know they're they're still tied. Uh, so volume wise, I can turn up the volume slightly. Okay. All right, hopefully that is better. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so thanks, uh, Hillbilly Reefer. Yeah, I mean, typically speaking, um, these microphones are quiet. So I, I always have to like play with them just a little bit and make sure that I don't completely overload them. So I turned them up by quite a bit. In fact, you know, I'm going to turn them down a little bit. I don't want to redline these mics because I don't really talk that loud. But at the same time, I'm like looking at my audio meters and it's like, yeah, might be a little bit hot there. Cool. All right. Taking a look at some, somebody, someone's just sent me a photo. Okay. Anyways, guys, what is going on in your reef tanks? Of all the things that are going on here, when it comes to the roof for the actual reef aquariums, it's like crickets. There's nothing really all that different that, that happens. We did a couple of things, um, but it's really kind of just shuffling around equipment, not really... It's just making stuff, I guess, like a little bit more organized and easier, but it's not necessarily anything that's going to um, affect any real change in the water itself. It's really about cleanliness and organization. Uh, let's see, what else is going on as far as like the tanks? We haven't set up any new tanks lately, but um, there, there's, a, there's a couple things that, that we're looking into. Uh, we got some free aquariums, right? And I think I mentioned it on like a, on an update that I had talked about a few, probably like a couple months ago. And a free tank here is never really a free tank. I mean, it's 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 awesome that you have like the four sides and the bottom. That's wonderful. But to really get it going, it kind of obligates you to do a whole lot. I mean, we would, so these, these tanks would have to be, um, kind of customized just a little bit. Um, the, they didn't really have overflow boxes and they're acrylic. So we would have to fabricate overflow boxes, do all the drainage and plumbing. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but the drainage and plumbing does require an inch and a half gate valve. And those are, that's a pretty pricey piece of equipment. By the way, there's nothing for these tanks to drain into because we don't have sumps for them. So we have to fabricate sumps. There's no return pump. There's no protein skimmer. There's no lights. So there's no other flow. There's no power heads. So these things kind of, you know, they, they do their own thing, right? So it would obligate us quite a lot. To invest into like getting those set up. Oh, and obviously there's no stand. 
I'd have to like, you know, call up Alufab and be like, hey guys, you know, I'd like another custom stand and blah, blah, blah. And then, then there's the process of actually hooking it all up. A lot of stuff to, to do. I would like to get them going because one of the things that we have started to do is farm bubble tips, bubble tip anemones. And they really do better when they're in their own tank. Like the ones that we have just by themselves, they've gone crazy. The ones that we have in another system with other corals and things like that, they tend to escape and sting something we like. Sometimes they don't do that well and you really can't, it just doesn't look quite right. Like they're in baskets, it, it's just all goofy. So they really do need, need their own, own aquariums. So one of these days we will have to make that commitment to get going and um, yeah, just, just bite the bullet make it happen. They're doing nobody any good sitting on the ground. Okay, comments. Let's let's talk. <laughs> Derek Wheatley. I'd appreciate your help on getting the Orphic Amazonas 960s dialed in. Um I don't really know if I can be that much help really. I would probably contact Orphic for that. Uh dialing it in like they are on a different controller now and i am pretty sure whatever that new control software is it's a million times better than what i am dealing with here because the when, when i purchased it it had such a rudimentary control it was not great like just simply put not great and we were able to get it to to some functional point and we just left it. We don't want to touch it. We don't ever want to fiddle with it. It's It was not good. So the lights themselves are pretty good. Uh, it, that's something that we might even go back to later because I do like the fact that they're super bright. They don't have like any fans or anything like that. They're all heat sink based. That's very cool. They are like IP67 rated, so they're like they're very moisture resistant, something that would be perfect in like a greenhouse, for example. Uh, and then you can customize their optics. So right now we have like very directional optics, like 15 degrees, which is really made to like punch down 20 feet into a very, very deep aquarium. And I, you, did, you heard me right, 20 feet, like public aquarium shark tank type stuff, right? Uh, but that is something that I might want to experiment with um, in the greenhouse because, uh, you know, you, we do have like the benefit of it being uh, like very moisture resistant, very, um, there's like no fans, like I said. And, you know, once you have like 120 degree optics on something like that, going from like 15 to 120, now you're like covering a whole lot of space. So, you know, that does help quite a bit. Um, as far as like, you know, what it's going to be like over your tank, that's going to be a ton of experimentation. And again, hopefully the controllers are better now. Salty Dad, I got cyano, lots and lots of cyano. Yeah, that can be like really frustrating. Um, it's one of those things that like can sneak up on your aquarium and it's usually an accumulation of bad habits that you've gotten away with for like a long time. And finally, uh, it hits like that threshold, cyano goes crazy, and it's really difficult to crawl out of that. Now, if Ryan from BRS was sitting next to me, I know exactly what he would say. He would be like, you need just to get chemi clean, follow the directions, and run a couple of cycles of that, that will fix your problem. He's probably not wrong in that. I always tend to go more with like uh, the more like the slower, more elbow grease, natural preventative stuff, fixing the root of the problem. But if you needed like that initial crutch to get you past that 
that really, really gross phase of cyano, that red slime, that's what I'm thinking. It really helps for that. Like, no question. Uh, like, yeah. The, the, we've only, like, done it a couple of times ever, but it was very noticeable, and it greatly speeds up the process. Now, chemically, you do have to really follow the directions and make sure that like the, the water stays oxygenated because uh, I know that some people have had issues where the oxygen level in the tank just tanks, just drops off, and you can lose fish and stuff like that at that point. So don't just do it willy-nilly. Make sure you know what you're doing, but it helped out a lot. Gordon Ellis Jr. Do you have any experience with aquaforest components one, two, three for dosing of foundational elements? I do not. Um, I messed with aquaforest like a long time ago. This is back when uh, a lot of like the back, like the ultra low nutrient bacterial stuff was kind of a fad, um, and it was a fad because it's very, very aggressive. And when we tried it, it killed like a whole bunch of our, coral our corals. We stopped using it. And that was the last time we ever messed with it. So I typically don't go for like the probiotic stuff. Hillbilly, perhaps some alternative use for the tanks. Think outside the box, mangroves, we have them, or alternate ecosystems, maybe plant-based. You know, I think that, um, we were we were thinking about doing something with macroalgae. Now, macroalgae is quite a lot more difficult than people give it credit for because what tends to happen is the conditions that macroalgae really likes and grows well in is also really, really, really good for other types of algae that you don't want. And some of that algae that you don't want will grow right on top of that macroalgae that you're trying to cultivate. So it is kind of like this double whammy. And um, I've, I've talked about this on, on other streams before, but one, one person that I was talking to, and you know, he is really into these decorative macroalgae tanks. I was asking like, so how do you prevent all this, uh, all the undesirable algaes from growing on your decorative algae? And it's not like you can throw in a herbivore because the herbivore is also going to eat your nice algae. And he's like, yeah, that is a problem. And what, what he does is he aggressively prunes the stuff. So we're talking like if he has to remove 90% or 80% of all the good algae to just to eliminate the bad stuff periodically, he'll do it. So you're talking about like, Every now and again, almost all of your stuff has to be pruned to like bare bones, tiny little pieces, and let it grow from there. And if you see some of the more of the bad stuff, prune it way back again, let it regrow. And I guess like over time, that kind of like polishes it up, but that's very labor intensive. And I think it's more for like, it would make sense for like a small show tank, less so for big cultivation. Having said that, there are people that do the big cultivation pretty well. We haven't really done it very well yet. I'm thinking, though, that down the road, when we start to upgrade a lot of our systems and move away from 300-gallon Rubbermaid tanks, I would think that a 300-gallon Rubbermaid tank is like a really good aquarium to do this, this algae in because a lot of the algaes like to be tumbled, and the best tanks to tumble stuff in are already round like a 300 gallon Rubbermaid stock tank. So it's certainly possible. William Bidwell. I bought multiple different Zoas from a rec recent frag swap and they've all opened up perfectly except for one. Um, it won't open up all the way. Any advice? So when it comes to zoas and not opening, they can be bothered by a lot of things. Sometimes it's pest related, 
but oftentimes is as simple as there's some kind of microscopic algae that's growing on them. And that is enough to, to kind of like just keep them closed. They naturally kind of produce like a waxy film, the zoas do. And every now and again, they'll like shed that off. So there's a couple of things at your disposal here. You can just direct more flow at them. And hopefully that just takes care of that issue. It helps them slough off whatever the problem is, whatever the algae is specifically. If it is not an algae issue and it's not just like a film issue, now you're talking about something that might actually be on there munching on it. And that's when like dips will help. Right now we do have a favorite dip and it's not just because they're a sponsor of the channel. We really like this dip a lot. It's uh, Polyp Labs Reef Primer. And this is one of the reasons why I like them so much. It's just in case you're tangentially worried about something. You're not exactly even sure what it is. You can dip it in reef primer knowing that it's probably not going to kill your coral. There's plenty of other dips that are hyper aggressive and they're really good at killing something very specific. And sometimes that is what that, that, that entails. Montepore eating nudibranchs. That's a problem. You really want to nail those. And sometimes like the thing that you have to nail them with is not that fun for the Montipora. In a case like this though, where it could be any number of things, uh, but I just want to do something. I want to be proactive. Uh, you could give it a dip in reef primer and I'm fairly confident that you're not going to royally screw up the coral. And it can solve like a whole bunch of things potentially. So that's an option. Another option is if you're really convinced that it is an algae slash film issue, what you can do is you can give it a quick dip. I mean, quick dip in hydrogen peroxide, like a solution of that, like a mild hydrogen peroxide solution, because that just completely destroys algae. And that can sometimes help perk up these polyps. Um, last, but probably should have been first, Dual water change. A lot of times, just the, the doing a water change will perk up a lot of corals that were kind of not feeling great. So hopefully that helps you. Dave. Dave says, I got dinos after using ChemiClean. Why were you using ChemiClean before you had dinos? That's interesting. Um, it took me three years to get rid of the dinos. You know, dinos seem to be one of those things that's really, really problematic, but it's only problematic, unfortunately, to the people that get dinos. I think a lot of times um, we've been able to dodge it here simply because our systems are never that clean. Lately, they've been getting cleaner, which I guess is good in its own way, but I think a lot of filtration methods, a lot of this probiotic stuff is trending a lot of people's home aquariums towards zero nitrate, zero phosphate. And that is that pretty much spells disaster for your tank, frankly because now you're inviting a lot of things like dinos to, to, to come in because people typically don't have dino issues when they have plenty of nutrient in their water. Uh, let's see, question about ick. Um, if we have problems in our main coral tank, is there any medicine that doesn't affect corals? Um, not really. There's some stuff that might help. I know that like there's a product called Ruby Reef Kick Ick that we have used before with corals in the tank, and it was okay-ish. I think it sort of helps, but I think that once it's in your tank like that, and by the way, it's probably in everybody's tank. I, I'm not one of those that really thinks that you can 
really keep it out because like a lot of the a lot of the folks that go extremely hard in trying to eliminate ick um yeah you're very likely to kill your fish like well before that it's it's and and the thing about ick it's one of those things that you can manage so easily just by like having things that pick pick it off of the coral pick it off of the fish let's say coral and then after that just keeping like the the fish's metabolism and, and and body healthy good nutrition and whatnot and low stress and it tends to take care of itself really nicely um but if you're looking for a medication specifically that is one that we've used but i don't know if there's like a great one out there Uh, when has Revive killed Coral? Still my fave. Revive kills Coral all the time. What are you talking about? We use Revive quite a lot. Um, there is a noticeable difference in how, how gentle that is versus um, Reef Primer. Like Reef Primer is a lot more gentle, like a lot, lot more. Now, having said that, Revive, Revive and Coral RX aren't necessarily that bad. Like we use that stuff for years. And like I said, we still use it to some degree. Um, but there's certainly certain corals that don't like it. I wouldn't dip elegance in it, for example. Um, like some of, like occasionally we'll see an elegance that has like one of those LPS flatworms, you know, it comes in on that and we're like, well, damn, we could dip it in something. And this is, this is before like we even knew about reef primer. It's like we could dip it in something, but chances are it will, royally annoy that coral and that coral will take about three months to recover like that sort of thing or we can literally take like a makeup brush and brush that little thing off and hopefully we get them all because that's way more gentle a, a lot of like what we do is now about trying to be as gentle as possible on the corals because the worst thing is you're taking like the time effort product expense of of the different dips and you're trying to be like preventative in some certain ways. Maybe you're reacting to something and you just end up killing a coral. And it's like, well, that was a tremendous waste of time, right? The Frugal Reefer, bronze level VIP. Welcome to the club. Thank you so much for your support. Appreciate it. Be the fountain. What is up? As if I don't text you all the time. <laughs> Welcome to the stream, B. Welcome to the stream. So B the Fountain is actually going to be um, visiting here later this month. We're going to record a couple more scientific journals. And we don't talk about it in advance. Like that's that's the beauty of it. She just surprises me. So we're just going to talk about something that she's looking at. Um, Adam H., I'll take your word for it when I run out of... By the way, full disclosure... Polyp Lab is a corporate sponsor of Tidal Gardens. But having said that, Reef Primer is really good. Like, really good. Um, Revive is also perfectly fine. And by the way, there is no perfect dip out there. We use like a multitude of different dips. Uh, and like I said, there's some that are going to be like way more effective for certain things than other things. For example, um, Captivate Aquaculture makes something called Anticipate, and it is, hold on, my, my screensaver came on. I lost chat. Um, it is really, 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 really good at killing certain things, specifically nudibranx. Like, nudibranx can resist a whole bunch of stuff, but that stuff super kills it. And when you're going through the effort of dipping corals for something like that, you need to make sure that stuff dies. Unfortunately for us, it's been like very aggressive. Uh, and, and a lot of our like Montes that we dip with it stay down colored for like a really long time. But like I said, Montipore eating nudibranx, that's another way to down color your Montes. Like those, those things are horrific to have. And you know, like, 
whenever there's like an outbreak of that stuff, we at least have an answer for it. And that's a situation where like, honestly, a lot of places are okay just throwing away those corals because any other efforts to try and dip them and everything like that, it's it might just simply not even be effective. It's better just to throw just to throw them away. Sounds like you know it sounds like awful, but that that is how dangerous Montipore eating nudie broncs are. They, it's no fun. Um, but yeah, so what else is, what else is like a very, very effective dip? Um, that bio advanced stuff that you can get from a hardware store, that stuff is super, super duper effective. Unfortunately, it is so incredibly toxic that I never like to use it here. We, we have it. We've used it in the past. It's it's milky in consistency. If you're not wearing gloves, you can feel it through your skin and it's not good. Like it doesn't hurt your skin, it hurts your like nervous system. And that stuff is pretty much illegal in every country except the US, I think. Like it's super toxic, but boy, does it kill stuff that you wanna kill and it is really gentle on corals, weird. Probably because of because the, Whatever it's affecting, the, the nervous system of corals is just completely different, so it doesn't have any effect. But it, ugh, it is gross stuff. Uh, let's see. You know what I wonder? Because here's the thing, when it comes to like fish diseases, I don't really know my stuff at all. I don't know very much at all, period. And um, when I when I talk to people that do know what they're doing, and when I try their methods, almost across the board, it ends up killing the fish. So I, so this is like a, a funny thing. So I, I had some Canadian friends over. I I, I lovingly re like refer to them as like the Canadians, but it was Patrick from Reef Wholesale and March from Fragbox. And Patrick from Reef Wholesale is probably one of the biggest fish wholesalers in that entire country. He goes through thousands of fish. He in bringing them in, getting them clean, and like he knows a lot about quarantine. And he and March are like really good friends. And I've picked Patrick's brain a million times at this point about fish quarantine. And I'm, and I'm guessing same situation with, with March, right? And March is like, nothing that I do really works. Even though, you know, he has like that, you know, access to, to Patrick. They live in the same city. They live in Toronto. Uh, but none of that stuff translates for him. So what he does and what I probably will be doing in the future is just having like basically a set up aquarium for new fish. I'm just going to put him in there for like three, four months and just see if they live. Like, that's it. Because every single time that we get like really creative and proactive on stuff, that fish dies. Like, oh, I see a fluke on a fish. We're gonna do like a freshwater bath for like X number of seconds, blah, 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 right? Dead fish. And I know that it was us that killed it because it was doing fine, fine meaning it had flukes, but it, but it had flukes. It was doing fine. You know, it's probably struggle bussing a little bit because it has flukes. We do this, we start doing this, this freshwater stuff, it's gone. We do this other kind of dip that's not a freshwater dip, it's gone. Uh, we try to do some sort of other treatment um, with either, oh, what is that stuff? Prazzy? Dead fish. Like everything we do just. It works for other people better than it does for us. That's why when people ask me, like, are you ever going to do, are you ever going to, like, sell fish? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It is, it is a mess. That is one of those, like, markets I just do not want to approach. Okay. Um, Michael Gervasi. Gervasi? My zoas all just up and died for no apparent reason two days ago. No, no idea of what I did. 
I wonder, um, did something eat it? Because usually when like Zoas just vanish suddenly, something develop a taste for them. I know that like for us, the the prime suspects would be tangs and fox faces. Every now and again, they just develop a, a munchie for them and they just go crazy. All your Montes died also within a week of getting them. Acro's all good. Um, hmm. Yeah, it's hard to say. But here's the thing that I'm just going to like throw out there. A lot of times, tanks that are good for acros aren't good for anything else. Like acros, and especially when you're trying to like go for specific colors and stuff like that, you kind of have to. I mean, they're all on some like weird low carb diet sort of thing and other 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 corals like it very different courtney jameson asks will a scroll coral do well in a low flow softy tank or does it need higher sps type flow they're pretty adaptable, very middle of the road. So I wouldn't say that it needs like high SPS type flow. Uh, however, their shape is kind of conducive to having stuff collect in like their bowl shape. And you want to make sure that that stays clean. So uh, too low of a flow might exacerbate that problem. But otherwise, I wouldn't expect it to, to need extremely high flow. I wonder how someone came up with dipping corals in Bayer. Yeah, I don't know. Like, that's getting awfully experimental. Because that stuff is so gross. I mean, yeah. Uh, CJ's Aquariums. Any elegance corals coming on the live? I don't think so. But there might be some on the website already. We haven't uh, we haven't really picked through a lot of elegance lately. I th and I think that the elegances that we do have might might still be in quarantine. Um, so my guess is no. Aqua balls, frag box TV. Very fantastic. March is a different breed out of this world. He's a character. No, I like him. I still would like to to visit those guys in Toronto. I just I don't have any travel plans for like this whole year seemingly for the rest of this year. CJ, I need to come visit again. It's been years. Yeah, I think if my memory serves, the last time that you were here. This building was just sticks. Like there was sticks meaning two by fours. <laughs> there was there's no building here. It had a floor, it had a frame, maybe, but there wasn't like you know anything. It was like a very, very rough construction still. Um yeah, so it's it's gotten a lot better since then. <laughs> it's gotten a lot better since then. Foxface, you just nailed it. Just added one. Uh, that's a bummer. I mean, we love fox faces here. We have them in a lot of aquariums. They are, I guess, no fish is really a hundred percent typically, but fox faces do get nibbly on certain things. They like favia. They like micromusa. Occasionally, they might snipe um, a zoa. You know, you know how it goes. <clears throat> Tohi, I feel you, Than. I live in Hawaii and I've had such terrible time with expert fish like leopard wrasse. Yes, leopard wrasses ship incredibly poorly. They ship so badly and never make it more than a couple months. A couple months is pretty good. So usually the problem is they die in a couple days. Uh, for a couple months, they tend to do better. We stopped buying leopard wrasses um, simply because of that. They, they don't come in well. They're like a doomed fish just by bringing them in. 
The Reef Garage. How do you make your zoas grow into tight colonies? So one thing, there, there's two things that'll help. More flow. A lot of times when the flow is too little, what tends to happen is they develop um, like pockets of detritus that, that build up on them. And that kind of causes them to recede right there. So you end up having like a more sparse colony. The other thing that, that makes them grow tighter is more light. Oftentimes, zoas that, that are not getting quite enough light will start to extend towards the light, kind of like daisies. And when, you're, when your zoas start reaching like that, that's when you know you probably need to crank up the light. Having said that, when you crank up the light, the, the polyps themselves are likely to shrink down. So you're going to get smaller, tighter, more vibrant zoas by going with more light, more flow. What's the perfect alkalinity for a reef tank? There really isn't a perfect one, but natural seawater levels is right around seven. Most people in the hobby keep theirs between eight or nine. Yeah, and, and the reason why you don't want to stay down towards seven is because in, in a home aquarium, unlike the ocean, it gets depleted pretty quickly. So you want to make sure that you have a little bit of a buffer to prevent you from diving down towards that seven range. But there really isn't a ton of benefit to go like above nine DKH. Some people, you know, they, it's, it's anecdotal, but they'll be like, they, they get better coral growth at like 10, let's say. Real talk, if your corals are healthy, they're going to grow out of your tank. Like a growth rate is not a problem for hobbyists. Growth rate is a problem for commercial operations. It's highly, I guess growth rate is a highly overrated statistic when it comes to, to aquariums. Like it's, it's one of those things like, this will make, you, this will make your, your corals grow even faster. I'm like, is that a good thing? Is that a good thing at all? I mean, maybe if you have just like a couple of frags, but usually, um, when you do this hobby successfully, uh, your issue is going to be corals bumping into the bumping into each other. Like that and neglect are going to be your bigger issues, not lack of growth rate. Aqua balls. I'm in LA, but to stock my 120 gallon, where is a good place to buy some fish? Um, something, something, 40 gallon quarantine to quarantine the fish. I don't know. Uh, here, here's a, here's a couple things. It's, I'm just going to go on my little rant about the fish market. You might um, be able to find fish cheaper at some places than others okay let's say for example somebody would even sell you a fish at a wholesale price level and you go to like your your local fish store and that fish is triple the price okay believe it or not there's a really good argument that that fish that's triple the price might absolutely be worth it because getting fish that are kind of like fresh off of a off of an importer's plane it is so delicate that the next you know 24 to 72 hours is critical critical time a, a lot of fish die in just that that time period it is such a rough experience for them and yeah, sometimes they're not coming from good places. Sometimes they're not coming into good places. It's not great. So the fact that your local pet store has a fish that sometimes they've had for like now two weeks, that is a very, very different animal than a fresh off the plane wholesale fish that's cheap. So 
if you have just like a local place that's clean, that has like the dates where, where they brought that stuff in, maybe they do quarantine at the shop, like all that stuff worth its weight in gold. I would take advantage of that stuff more if I didn't need like a million fish to stock a system. Luckily these days, we do have the benefit of stocking slowly because for the most part, we have systems, they have fish. But every single time that we get a new shipment of fish, I kind of hate life because it is just, it's a crapshoot. Sometimes they're just, they're just no good out of the box. Sometimes just the very act of trying to be proactive and trying to treat illnesses, the medication itself starts to kill the fish. Uh, all kinds of stuff could go wrong. Um, oftentimes, your quarantine setup is an afterthought compared to your main system. So you might be a little bit less diligent about the types of equipment that you're using. You might be like, you know what? I had this old heater. I'm just going to use it. For us, that really bit us because when we started to actually test voltages in the, in, the, in the different tanks, we were pumping in lethal voltages into the water because some of those very hobby grade um, items, they were just in some state of disrepair and were just, yeah, they're just leaking voltage left and right, like 40 volts into the water. That's not great. So, yeah. There's not a great answer that I got for you, but sometimes what is seemingly an outrageously priced fish is a pretty good deal because you cannot save money on dead fish. Uh, huh. Interesting. Oh, by the way. Hey, what's up, Bahamalama? Hope you are doing well, Remy. Bucky, oh, by the way, Bahamalama, the next time that you see this studio, it's way better than the last time you were here. I got, I got some new things. Um, okay, so Bucky is asking, can you use magnesium media with a Kalkwasser reactor? I've never really tried that. So, okay, a couple of thoughts. I'm not exactly sure what kind of magnesium media you're even talking about. So usually when we dose magnesium, we have like magnesium sulfate and magnesium chloride, and we just dose it, right, directly. So it doesn't need to be in a reactor. It's just on a dosing system, which a calcarot Wasser reactor, you'd be on a dosing system anyway with. The other thing about it is the, the magnesium media. We run calcium reactors here. And ARM, aragonite reactor media, is a media that is high in magnesium. So a calcium reactor, you're really doing it for calcium and alkalinity. It's aragonite. But this particular kind is also high in magnesium. And lately, our magnesium values have been low. Previous to that, they were crazy high because we were running this aragonite, this ARM media, ARM media, or aragonite reactor media media. Uh, so, but, but we were using that, and we didn't know why our stuff was spiking, our magnesium was spiking, because the package, when you buy it in bulk, doesn't say high magnesium formulation. It's just, a, it's just a blank bag. So we had no idea. And it was only until I looked online and saw the retail packaging and said, oh, that explains a lot. Fast forward to today, we are struggling to keep magnesium high and we're putting in like lots of magnesium chloride, like 30 cups or something. And uh, so now we're swapping back all of our calcium reactor media to ARM. <clears throat> Mike, I was just in Aruba, kind of jealous. I'd be, I've never been, but it looks nice. And fish that were swimming up to us were crazy spotted puffers, blue tangs. If I ever lived there, I would have a crazy tank. I would be the opposite. I would be 
like snorkeling and diving like all the time. Mike also, oh, hold on, before Mike, Daniel, my problem with growth rate is just don't grow much and get outpaced by other coral. Eh, it happens. Yeah, I mean, our systems, you know, we, a lot of, like, I'd say that like 99% of everybody does like a mixed reef of some sort. These things are not found in the same conditions. So certain things are going to like it more than others. There's a lot of overlap and a lot of adaptability with corals, but yeah, there's going to be some that it just hits that sweet spot and they're going to grow a lot quicker than others. Uh, nope, I watched the shipment. This is Mike saying, I nope, I watched the shipments come in and bags are immediately floated in the tank. They're going in. I don't know any local that quarantines first. It is uncommon, but they they do exist. Again, they might charge a huge premium. Like, uh, actually, if you're in LA, I know that like um, Marine Collectors is there. I have never personally worked with Marine Collectors. Okay, uh, I just know them like through like mutuals, like with with Bulk Reef Supply and stuff like that. Right, mutuals, Ryan. <laughs> um, but I mean, it'll be like five hundred, six hundred dollars for like a copper band. But he will have taken the thing fully through quarantine. So if you really just need one fish. Maybe that's an option for you. Uh, if you need like ten copper bands, like I do, that's less of a that's less of a thing that's going to work out. Uh, but there are like some folks that do the whole quarantine thing. Uh, Brinks one two eight uh, island fish and scale in Long Island quarantine their fish. Okay, cool. Never heard of them. B, y'all may not know this, but Than also gets super upset when animals die. He actually does hate life when they get a new fish. Yeah, it's true. It's supposed to be a fun hobby, not a immediate regret. What the heck are we doing here? Hobby, right? Okay, the Aquascape Corner. What is the smallest low tech reef tank size you would recommend to a first time reefer? planning on lots of softies amongst other corals uh a 40 breeder let's say so here's the thing about like uh like low tech and small aquariums and stuff it can be done and it's really difficult sometimes to put myself in the shoes of somebody new because it's been like a generation. I mean, I've done this for like over 30 years, right? So I've seen a lot and I just kind of like assume things and that's just not other people's experiences at all. So I'll just, I'll throw in this anecdote real quick. Somebody was asking, uh, and they've never done this hobby before, and they wanted to get like a, a big aquarium, two, 300 gallon tank, let's say. And they were asking like, okay, what is the cheapest that I can do this? I'm like, for you, it's going to be like ten to fifteen thousand dollars, and they're like, "No, that's going to be too much." I'm like, "Yeah, probably is going to be too much," and they're like, "What is the absolute cheapest?" I'm like, "If everything went perfectly, you could do it for five, but actually, no, I could do it for five, five thousand. You can't do it for five thousand because you don't know enough. You don't know. You don't know the corners that can be cut." You don't know, like, okay, I can save money here by doing this instead, right? For example, if you wanted to go a lot cheaper on, like, your filtration requirements and the, tech, the technology that makes life easier to maintain water chemistry, you can do stuff like do more aggressive water change every week and or set up a continuous water change system. These days, you can set up a continuous water change system with two dosing pumps and two buckets. Like, it's pretty simple. And a system like that, you know, provided that, that you're able to like maintain it nicely, 
will work wonders for your tank. And yeah, like theoretically, you don't need a fil you don't need filtration if you are willing to do all the work that the filtration was going to do for you. Like a lot of equipment that tends to be like that high tech, so you're looking for like a low tech thing. A lot of that stuff is not necessary in and of itself. It's providing a ta it's it's providing uh, a service of some kind for your system to make your life easier. So it's, it requires less elbow grease on your part. And the math on that is at some point, yes, a protein skimmer is, the cost of a protein skimmer is such a good deal compared to the amount of elbow grease that you're going to have to do yourself. Or filter socks. Filter socks do great work. Uh, it's kind of an ordeal to kind of have it all integrated into your system and all that stuff. But, you know, sometimes a sump comes with uh, filter sock holders. They require maintenance on their own. They're fantastic. Are they necessary? Absolutely not. I For 30 years, I didn't use them. We use them now. They're more work, but they do a really good job. Stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Okay, Bucky Solomon, can I add magnesium sulfate with Kalkwasser? So I wouldn't do that simply because Kalkwasser is by nature incredibly reactive. So no, I wouldn't do that. I would just have it done separately. Do you prefer calcium reactor over Kalkwasser? I don't have a preference right now. We use them both, if that makes any difference. Every single system now has, except one, has a Kalkwasser dosing system and a calcium reactor. Okay, so B is asking, I've never um, had the need to set up a calcium reactor, which makes, um, makes me like Kalkwasser more. It's your computer. Mm -hmm. My mom just came into the studio asking why her computer looks fuzzy. Your uh, your YouTube has defaulted to a a crummy resolution. Here, give me your laptop. Okay. YouTube has defaulted to. There you go. I don't know. Have you guys noticed that where like YouTube now defaults to like the most potato resolution? I find that like supremely annoying. It's like no, no. If the if, if the person is uploading at like 4K or at the very least 1080P, that's the resolution that I want to see it at. So like my mom's like computer, for example, was at 144p. Not great. Sigi at Tech Gear Talk. What is up? What is up? You know, I didn't mention, so I, I, I actually talked to him recently over the phone. You know, I didn't mention this, but I was right around the corner from your place. I was up uh, near Cleveland Heights. Uh, I was picking up that, um, that restoration hardware chest. It was more or less around the corner from you. And it's like, I would have stopped it and said hello, but we had to get back. It was around the clock. Salty Dad is asking, Than, have you ever kept a Christmas tree worm rock? Yes, I still have one, in fact. They are not my favorite thing to ship, so we don't really sell them. But we have one or two hanging out. Muhammad Al Amir. Uh, I was thinking of buying a normal ATO product and somehow replace the pump that comes with it with my Versa pump. Uh, 
So you would, were you thinking of having the ATO turn on the Versa? Is that the idea? Um, I suppose you could. I guess alternatively, what you could probably do is just program the Versa to roughly compensate, like like a, just a volume that more or less covers your daily evaporation. That's another option. That's probably how I would do it personally. Like, you know, just with, with some experience with your tank, uh, just figure out, okay, well, I'm topping off this much. I'll just go slightly less per day with the Versa. Uh, the, the only thing, the only reason being, I don't really trust ATOs. Uh, there's all kinds of like issues that could go wrong with that. If something goes wrong with the Versa, it just doesn't put water in. Like it almost never gets stuck running. And even then, if it gets stuck running, just make sure that your reservoir of water isn't like infinite. So make it so like, oh, well, you, you'll overdose, but it won't be catastrophic, something like that. That's how I would do it. Real Wiser, how does Tidal Gardens deal with red planaria? So there's a couple things you can do. Um, there's a stuff that will sort of knock them down. Uh, things like flatworm exit and levamisole. We typically don't do that a ton, but we probably, okay. So levamisole is a little aggressive and it makes your fish sick and stuff, especially your wrasses. So I, I tend to stay away from levamisole. Stuff like um, flatworm exit, it's milder. It's also less effective. Um, <laughs> And this is actually a conversation that I had directly with Salifert, but they only sell it in like these quantities, right? The entire package, all the boxes and everything like that has like a little thing this big. And that is like the, that is, that's the product. And so I was even like, I was talking to like Habib, uh, you know, who, you know, the owner of, of Salifert. And I'm like, do you just like sell, you know, like Gatorade bottles full of this stuff to the, like, you know, commercial coral farms? And they're like, no, the product is only this. And I would need like, you know, it, like a, a pallet uh, of this stuff and only because it's in boxes, you know, like it's in the Sailorford box. You've seen those. So, okay. So there's that, that that's one option for you. The other option is to do what we do. <laughs> and periodically take all the corals out, dip everything, catch all the fish, you know, put them in a bucket with an air stone. Uh, and then we completely take that tank apart and rinse it out with fresh water and vinegar. And we restart it later that day. So we hard reset a tank. That's another way to do it. Uh, a third way is to buy some damsels, like, uh, a lot of different types of damsels, in particular Springeri damsels, like to eat red planaria. So there you go. One thing that I probably would not do is buy um, those nudibranchs that are like the velvet nudibranchs. Now, those guys 100% eat flatworms. Okay, It's not that they don't do their job. They do do their job. The problem is sometimes those flatworms are too toxic for them. So when we buy them, they come in and they start sniping away. And I'm like, awesome. And then 20 minutes later, they just like roll onto their back and die. Yeah. So I tend to stay more towards like the damsel end of the spectrum. The Frugal Reefer, new YouTube member, The Frugal Reefer. I imagine that's probably an individual thing in my case. Calc supplementation with a calc reactor has done wonders for my tanks. Um, yeah, I, 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 Calc Wasser does a lot of really good stuff. A lot of really good stuff. Calcium reactors, the beauty of calcium reactors is you really can't overdose on them very much. Uh, they kind of just run and they're very, very gentle and very stable. 
But yeah, uh, Bucky, that's interesting. I've read Kalkwasser with Calcium Reactor Works Wonders. And they're like strangely synergistic because the, um, the effluent that comes out of a calcium reactor slightly lower in pH. And Kalkwasser uh, is naturally high in pH. So it can, it can kind of offset the drop in pH that a calcium reactor might impart onto a system, especially in a system that is in a basement or something that doesn't get a lot of gas exchange. Uh, also, just like the lower pH water uh, might make the calc dissolve better. And so, yeah, it's complementary, complementary. Uh, Stephen P. 2003, Awkwardics. Uh, I've noticed that too. I'm surprised to see that YouTube actually defaulted to 1080p60 for this stream. Yeah, it's weird. Uh, Raymond Hill. I have a fairly new system, about 12 weeks. Cleanup crew has been doing a good job. This morning, I saw two Aptasia anemones on one, anemones on one of the hermit crab shells. Where should I go from here? Well, you can take that little shell out, give it a good scrubbing. Uh, here's the real deal truth of it. If you're in this hobby, you're going to get Aptasia. It is absolutely everywhere. It comes in on everything. There's a ton of different species of Aptasia. It's just part of the hobby. Uh, yes, you want to keep it out as best you can. It's already in your tank. Let's say you're, you weren't in this hobby for 12 weeks. Let's say you're in this hobby for like a year, two years. You're gonna get it. You're gonna see it. It's not a big deal. So since it's just like a little bit right now, go ahead and scrub it off. It'll be fine. Um, chances are it'll spring back up later. And that's, again, not a big deal. Maybe get a peppermint shrimp that sometimes can keep it at bay. The Lido Jr. does the red Xenia pulse. Okay, so this is like probably where we should rename a product because there's like red Xenia and red C Xenia. So red C is a pulsing variety. A red Xenia is more of like that, that brownish auburn reddish color, okay? And that's more of like a tree-like growth. Oh, it's almost like a cispicularia, but it's not a cispicularia. Uh, that stuff does not pulse. Uh, does the red Xenia grow too fast? Not really, but it's gonna grow just like anything else. How do the corals survive the hard reset? They're fine. Because like our systems are all interconnected. It's it's just one it's one tank in a larger system. For like a home like a home aquarium, it's the, the hard reset is not the thing that's gonna stress the coral out. It's if we also dip the coral, that's gonna stress it out. Uh, we we had a conversation about dips earlier. There's no such thing as a perfect dip. We we are now prioritizing dips that are like ultra gentle because sometimes there's nothing wrong with a coral. But since we're doing this work anyway, we may as well just dip everything also. So at that point, we don't want to overly stress the corals out. So that's why I like reef primer and stuff like that, like the potassium salt based dips. Um, but yeah, but just moving that into like a, a holding tank for a few hours, that's not going to do anything. Corals don't care about that. Uh, that but that, that hard scrub, that hard reset, it does wonders for, for the cleanliness of a system. Wonders. Dangles. Hi, Than. Me again, here to remind you to schedule a TG dive trip. I can't schedule anything. I want there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of event planning that needs to happen. I need like a, an event coordinator. Uh, the little junior. When keeping twenty gallon tanks, is it worth it to get a, uh, to get an RO system, or better to rely on an LFS? Uh, it's really up to you. I mean, 
I would rather have one for myself personally. Uh, I like to have just just the autonomy of having my own stuff. And when you're relying on the LFS, you probably like most people don't do this, right? But most people that are getting their stuff from an LFS don't take the additional step of testing the LFS's RODI water. Most people don't. Sometimes I, I have heard horror stories where like they did do a test and that water was like a hundred something TDS coming out of their RO system. So, you know, at least if it's your own thing, you know, you've you've you know the maintenance schedule on it. You theoretically would do your own testing, that sort of thing. David Garcia Jr. These lives are always great and full of information. Thanks, Dan. Thank you for for hanging out. And it, I'm glad somebody gets something out of these things. <sighs> Let's see. Uh, Jeremy Dorrance. I've noticed a fair amount of my Coraline allergies bleaching out. Water parameters are in check. I want to make sure I'm not missing something. Uh, depends on what color your Coraline is. But if you're looking for like that deep purple Coraline, what might be happening is your lighting might be too strong. I don't know if you've upgraded your lighting recently or um, increased your lighting duration, but that is a really good way to kill Coraline is, uh, is too much light. Uh, Bucky, do you do ICP testing by whom and how often? Uh, we do. We've used a couple of different brands at this point. We do it roughly once a month. So we send out, that's, that's eight tests once a month. Um, I don't put a, a ton of faith in it. I'm basically looking for trends. I'm basically looking for like, if something is zero, I'm not looking to hit a specific number. I'm looking for something that's like, so, so, so here's my rule of a lot of these things. Okay. I just want to get off of zero. So for example, manganese or something, just some random trace element. I don't care that the ideal level of manganese is such and such parts per million. Do not care. I do know that if that number is zero in my systems, I might see some problems. So just getting off of zero is, is my goal there. Um, but as far as like the brands that we've used, we've used the unique corals one. What are they? Triton, unique corals is Triton. Um, we've used Fauna Marine a couple of times. I think we got like a couple of free test kits. I've also used um, Reef Labs ICP. And there might be another one in the mix that I'm forgetting about entirely. Uh, the last ones that we've used are Reef Labs. Kenneth K, greetings from Denmark. Which peristaltic would you recommend for Kalkwasser? Uh, we are using, um, we're using the Ecotech ones, the Ecotech Versa, Versa return pumps, or no, return pumps, peristaltic pumps. Uh, I like them because, you know, they seem pretty robust. They were easy for us to program and they, um, They're very quiet. Uh, we were using the dose pump from Neptune, but in comparison, that sounded like an aircraft engine. It was the loudest thing in this entire building. Like you could hear it from on a different floor. It was, it was way, way loud. And that's not just me being like, oh, Than's being like overly sensitive to noise again. It was loud. And the fact that I cannot hear the, the Ecotech ones, that's the one I favor. And now I don't even think I'm stepping on any toes. It's all the same company. Or at least under the same company umbrella. 
Tohi, what's your experience with Asterina starfish? I have a strain that eats coralline algae. That's kind of cool. <laughs> By the way, uh, coralline algae is a moderately beneficial thing to have, okay? It is better than the alternative, which is probably hair algae. But coralline algae can like grow right next to stony corals and prevent their growth. So yeah, having something that dials back coralline is also beneficial. So here's my thing about Asterinas. Some species of Asterina will eat corals. That's not great. Lots of Asterina like to hang out on your class. That's kind of unsightly, and they do reproduce a lot. So what we tend to do is we kind of like prune their numbers manually, just by hand whenever we see them, and we euthanize them, okay? Here's the thing, though, guys. They do a really good job of keeping your tank clean. Assuming that, they, that you don't have like the, the bigger, browner varieties that eat corals, uh, I am willing to bet that a tank that has Asterina stars is going to be a much cleaner, nicer tank than one that does not have it, with the exception that they're, they're going to be hanging out on your glass. So if you don't mind just like, you know, running your algae scraper blade and just like knocking them all off, uh, like your rock work is going to be clean. Your piles of detritus are going to be better managed. Your coral line is going to be like manicured. It's going to be a nicer tank, but they have that reputation of being a pest because they, they reproduce a lot and they hang out on the front glass. So people don't like them. And, and obviously the whole eating the coral thing is kind of bad. Your tang might start doing the same thing. Like whatever that starfish was eating, like your, your favorite fish might do the, literally the same thing. Like right now, I think that polar reef, um, his favorite butterfly fish has like started eating all the corals in, in that giant tank of his. Reading chat again. Hmm. What's the most updated book on reefing, which explains the different methods like triton balling? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't gotten a book in a little while. Hate to say it, but online forums are probably your best bet at this point. Lincoln Towns. Uh, wait, I'm going to go back one thing. Uh, Javidin Wellness Center. I spotted a spaghetti worm in my tank. Something to handle. Is it cleanup crew type of organism? It sort of is, but at the same time, it sort of isn't. Yes, they do a good job of detritus um, management. They reproduce like crazy. There was a time, and I think that time still might be now, where people... Um, they like to buy those as a part of a cleanup crew. Uh, here's the problem that I have with them. They also like to hang out at the base of corals, and they, they bother the coral enough to cause it to recede. In particular, I've, I've had them like do that with certain things like Micromusa and Blastomusa. So nowadays, we, we take them out and euthanize them. But yes, they do that function pretty darn well. I just don't like the fact that like they, they irritate corals enough to like make them stop growing. So Lincoln, Than, what would cause the tips of SPS to die and start growing algae? Uh, something might have nibbled a tip, or perhaps like something got caught on a tip and then uh, to cause just like that little bit of die off and then algae will grow on that, on that tip. That's my guess. If you were to redo your system, would you keep it centralized or individual for each aquarium? Um, 
I just did a video on this. There's benefits to both. I would have it centralized because, um, so actually what I would do is I would have it in, I'd have it a, a one central filtration sump. Uh, and, and just have it do like the works. So there's like, there's degrees to this game, right? One of the coolest things that I've seen um, that MRC does in their sumps, like MRC makes like these gorgeous giant sumps, like, you know, like the professional grade uh, public aquarium type sumps. So they, uh, they have like the water intake coming in to a, a filter sock array or a filter sock roller, okay? And sometimes like this filter sock roller is, it looks like a billboard printer. It's like 48 inches wide, it's gigantic. And like he said that one place, they don't have to change that filter sock roll uh, for an entire year or something. I'm like, that's pretty remarkable. Anyway, it goes through like a filter sock thing or roller. Then it goes through a chamber of uv and like this is really smart like his uv system uh all the bulbs are individually accessible right there you know you don't have to like un like decouple it uh, like, do anything with plumbing or anything like that they just like slot right down in and it's sized for the size of your, your of your system and the flow rate going through the sump and that is sometimes nice uh, that's a nice thing about having like, you know, like pros and engineers actually do the math on your system. So it's like, this is sized to do the job. It's not just like, I think, it, I think this is about right. And just going to kind of go going with the flow. Uh, I did hear a price quote, not from MRC directly, but I did hear a price quote and that UV option might have been five figures might have been five figures for that but you know in 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 a big public aquarium those numbers make a lot more sense anyway uh where was i going with that where did i come from oh centralized so i would want to have like a big single centralized thing really well thought out really easy to access everything really easy to clean service all that stuff right but then i would want to have 12 tanks attached to that system specifically 12 because once a month i want to fully oh back up ever so slightly 12 tanks one of which will always be bone dry empty okay bone dry for a month it'll be sitting there bone dry empty and what i want to do is then leapfrog the next tank over so catch all the fish, take all the frags, dip, whatever I need to do, swap it over into that, that empty tank, you know, obviously fill it up with water uh, and <clears throat> just leapfrog it over, fully break down that tank, drain it out, spray it down with whatever, bone dry for another month, then leapfrog it. So once a month, I'm going to cycle, crop rotate through that because random stuff will accumulate. I'm not even saying, oh, oh, it's a horrible pest. It could be as something as simple as an algae that I don't want growing anymore. And having this like periodic crop rotation through that, that is how I would eliminate like 90% of the problems that I would have and just keep it on a schedule, like to like, because like a drum beat. So kind of best of both worlds in that sense. The frugal reefer. I've had Astrina seemingly devour some of my zoas. It is possible. There are some that definitely eat coral. Normally, they will be eating Pastelopora, not zoas, but I've also seen them like go right over top of zoas. And here's the coin flip on that it might just be eating the film algae because they do like that. They like film algae. So they might be doing the zoas some benefit. It's entirely possible that they're also just eating zoas. So, 
there's that. Mohammed, planning to start plumbing from a new house tomorrow and need to double check. Can Versa pumps move water 10, uh, 15 to 20 meters? Uh, also, any re uh, advice regarding speeds or programming? I appreciate it. Okay, speeds and programming, like, look it up online. There's, like, tutorials. I've done it, like, three times ever. If I was able to figure it out, you can definitely figure it out. Uh, as far as it moving water, 15 to 20 meters, the head pressure is more important than the distance. The distance it's not really going to care about if there's no head. Uh, supposedly, it can do 18 feet of head. So meaning that if you wanted to like send it upstairs, that might be an issue. But if it's just going like straight laterally, it might not be an issue. Toke Lao Islands. Are the white edges on chalices growth? Most of the time, yes. Ali H. Will other morphs of Discosoma fight, or can you keep a garden like Zoas? Uh, I think Discosoma mushrooms play well together. Little caveat on that. Right now, most of the ones that we have are all from the same area. They're all from Australia. I don't really recall mixing the Australian ones and the Indonesian ones. So it's not out of the realm of possibility that there might be an issue, but I wouldn't expect there to be. Uh, Ronnie Johnson, any opinions on mixing bubble tip anemones? It seems like there's a lot of conflicting info out there. I have not had good experiences mixing them. We've We've had a situation where... We had one variety, we added another variety, and not just like one, we added like 18. And within like a few months, the 18 that we added were all gone, just vanished. So now we do not add bubble tips of different varieties into the same system, even if it's like a different tank in the same system. We, we have it all completely separate. Um, I think in the future, what we would like to do is to give each of those their own aquarium. And for the sweet spot for us is about a 60-gallon aquarium for those guys. 60-gallon aquarium, one clownfish. And we call it good. My and started eating a chalice. Never heard of that before. Immediately banished the tang. Yeah, it happens. It's weird, but it definitely happens. Spanky, how do you euthanize the unwanted? As a hobbyist, should we just flush them? It's roughly the same thing. Uh, yeah, kind of. I mean, we also have like muriatic acid baths for stuff. Sometimes they get bathed. We also have, uh, yeah. Just make sure that it dies. Like, I don't like to see stuff suffer. E even like the pestest of pestest things, I don't like to see stuff suffer. How do you remove the spaghetti worms from the from a tank? Uh, you can siphon them very easily. We we have a we have um. Actually, it doesn't matter if you have a substrate or or bare bottom. You can siphon them very easy. They siphon easily out of a substrate. They siphon easily off a of bare bottom. The Aquascape Corner. What are your thoughts on macroalgae in the reef aquariums? Don't love it. Not in the ref refugium, but in the display. So I don't love it because one of two things is going to happen. Either you're going to have herbivores that you're going to like, tangs, fox faces, things of that sort. And they're going to they're going to make short, like very quick work of your, your macroalgae garden. Or you do not have those herbivores. And at that point, your macroalgae is going to directly compete with your corals. It's going to compete for nutrient and space. And it's going to do the space combat by basically digging its roots into them and killing them. 
So you really don't want to, to mix that up. People do it. It's not what I like to do. Emmanuel, I can keep Acropora alive and growing in my tank, but Millipora are a no-no for me. That is strange because Acropora and Millipora tend to be an easier variety. Not easy, because I don't know if too many Acroporas are that easy, but easier, I would say. Um, if that's going on, that makes me wonder if there's something that's that's like a, specifically a Millipora thing that, that's messing with them. Um, Millipora are one of the varieties that Acropora eating flatworms like to hover around. There's there's definitely some favorites out there. Like um there's one that we call like a blueberry fields that that tends to have it. Uh the what are those things called? It's uh, a purple bonsai, the bonsai varieties. Oh my gosh. Those are almost like a canary in the coal mine as far as like acropora eating flatworms. Um fox flame, that that variety also tends to be the like the first one that that has a problem. And we have seen them before on milliporas in the past. What butterfly fish is the culprit for eating the corals at Polo? Um, I forget. Maybe it's a Pakistani butterfly. I, I forget. I forget. I, I'm not. I'm. I'm really not into like fish <laughs> at all. Wait, we, we were talking about fish flushing fish down the toilet. No, we. I, I was talking about flushing like like legit pests and stuff. Okay, anyhow. I need a quick drink. I've got like a sip left of water. <clears throat> okay, so that pretty much gets me caught up on chat. Um, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, like, I was thinking, going back to system design, that to me is kind of like the fun thing to do in this hobby. Like once you actually have the systems all built, it is a little bit less interesting for me to be perfectly honest, but it is, it's a cool thought process when, you know, you've done, when you've built like these multi-tank systems before, and then you're like, okay, here are just like the little quibbles that I have with, with this, you know, how do I improve it for next time? Okay. Well, that was great. It's, it's working better. I, you know, I fixed all those issues. But there's this other thing that I've got an issue with. And like, how do I go about, you know, making that whole process easier? I'm like, okay, fix that. And then now it's like, okay, um, when you have like, I don't know, 15,000 gallons of like, however many aquariums that we have here, the reality of the situation is, it is a team effort to keep stuff, uh, to keep these things running. So you have to like approach everything differently. It's not just about the corals. Obviously, all, all the decision making at the end of the day is for the benefit of the animals. But the practicality is that these systems have to be built for human beings to work on. And that is a completely different exercise altogether. And it, it's something that I definitely enjoyed embracing when I was putting this building together because it turns out that like wide aisleways be between four to six feet wide is better than a slightly bigger aquarium. A slightly bigger aquarium is a pain in the butt. The aquarium was big enough. What you needed was space to move around and work access to lots of workstations, access to lots of sinks, um, just like where do your towels go, right? 
in a lot of these really, 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 really pretty systems, uh, it looks very sleek, but what do you do when your hands get wet? <laughs> you know, did you just make a giant puddle on the ground where you're standing? Like all these little things are kind of uh, like another layer that I don't think that too many people when they're planning their systems really think about or have to consider. But once they start to get big enough, all of these things really come into play. Also, like for example, this building is 120 something feet long. And you know we have like like a Dyson stick vacuum that's downstairs, but it's at one end of the bit one end of the building, which means that like if you needed to vacuum something, it's a tr it's it's a walk. It's like it's you know 120 feet one way, 120 feet back to do the task. That task is probably not going to get done. So sometimes it is like yeah, you need to have like a vacuum cleaner on the wall available every so many feet, otherwise vacuuming doesn't happen. Like it's, it's, it's this sort of thing. Like you need to make it real easy for stuff to happen. And I actually think a lot of those lessons, they, they translate to the home aquarium. Uh, I, I've seen you know, some people's systems where it's like certain things don't ever get done because of how difficult the design of the tank made that task. Like, a water change in and of itself isn't that difficult. But you know what is difficult? If your source of water is on a different floor, like, oh, okay, so I need to go upstairs to do something or I have to go downstairs to do something, that kind of sucks. So I guess like if, you're, if you are planning your own system, think one or two steps ahead, not just like, oh, I want a 120, I want to get Red Sea this and that, I want to get Ecotech this and that, I want to splurge and get an abyss pump. Like, settle down. How far away is a sink? Do you have access to a drain? You know, that, that type of thing. Dangles, what would you suggest for a beginner SPS 5 frag pack? Um, so... If you are looking to get into SPS for kind of a branching stick appearance, I like to look at Bird's Nest, Pasolapora, things of that sort, Stylophora. If you're looking for plating stuff, uh, I would say most Matapora are going to be pretty good for that. There's encrusting and there's plating. Like, for example, the one that you're seeing now is an encrusting. Uh, this, like, it's, it's a, this is a vino. It is not necessarily a difficult one to keep, but it is very slow growing. There's, there's other types, especially the plating varieties of Monty that are very fast growing. Would you ever expand your facility into fish sales as well? Never. We do fish very poorly here. Uh, Reef King just set up the ozone on the six foot tank. The water is so clear. Yes. I'm a big fan of ozone. You know who isn't? Raj from MRC. <laughs> he is like, he would never recommend it on a home aquarium. Uh, it's one of the cooler things that I've done. I, I like it a lot. But he did suggest, like, you know, you really should vent this outside. Like, take, take some more precautions to get this, like, residual ozone out of the building because it can be dangerous. So I'm like, okay. Uh, Evolution 8R. I'm new here. So this is a virtual show. There is no convention style show, right? I don't know what that means. You might have to restate that. A virtual show. As in it's on the internet? <laughs> Uh, Steven13, uh, Title Gardens member. 
channel member, Steven13. Hey, Than, I was, it was great meeting you in August. Our Dragon Soul Torch is thriving in Philadelphia. Very nice. Glad it's worked out, Chris. Good job. The Aquascape Corner. What corals, if any, can grow and thrive under full white LEDs? Um, I have a few pure white freshwater LEDs. I'm wondering if I can use them on a reef. Um, so I have a few, few pure white L freshwater LEDs. Okay, so a cu couple of issues. One might be the intensity. Freshwater ones might not be very bright. Um, also, full white LEDs might not be very flattering, period. There are some, and by the way, I made a video on this. There are a few styles of corals that look amazing under like all white. So for example, like basically stuff that doesn't fluoresce. Certain leather corals don't fluoresce. Amazing. Uh, clams look amazing. Um, tabastria, sun corals look amazing. So the, you do have like a selection there. But some other corals might not color up nicely depending on the LED because it was kind of interesting. Uh, in the past, like light spectrum coming off of a bulb, let's say like a metal halide, um, there was actually like more usable blue light in an Iwasaki 6500 Kelvin light, which was like practically yellow in color compared to like a 14,000 Kelvin sunburst metal halide. <clears throat> Excuse me. But that was like a metal halide specific specific phenomenon where you could like grow insanely nice colorful corals under what looked like a super gross yellow looking light. Um, LEDs are different because of just how they generate light. So a blue LED and a white LED are actually the same thing, except that the white LED has different phosphors that change the blue light to white. That took a little while for me to wrap my brain around. But the blue LED is a higher energy state than the white LED. And the big, I guess, um, yeah, that was like the, the big innovation of LED was like to, to get that white color. Uh, it was a manipulation of a higher energy blue LED. So when you're saying that you have like a white LED, I don't know, you might, it might get weird results. Reef King, it's such a shame you don't ship to London, England. Your corals are amazing. So I've got a friend in, uh, in London, not London, she's like in Essex. Uh, and so she, I believe, uh, I think, I'm trying to remember if she's wholesale only, but it's Eco Marines. And uh, she has very nice corals, so check her out. Uh, Jeremy Davis, does Tidal Gardens keep Mythos Acropora still an underrated acro in my opinion? Uh, I believe so. I think so. Uh, the Frugal Reefer, I read that you could also vent the ozone through carbon as well. Yes, that would work. Um, Yes, possibly. It, it It is very effective as, as long as you keep up with the carbon, I believe. Uh, do you use o UV and ozone at, at your facility? Yes to both. Uh, do you like your 1,000 gallon per day RO system? Yes. They're kind of necessary. Kind of necessary. And I think mine might be 3,000 gallons per day. I think technically it might be 3,000. I'm not really sure. I forget. Salty Dad, I have a few different types of stylos that are about to touch. Will they harm each other? There's a chance that they will. There's a chance that they will. I don't think that they're a particularly aggressive coral, though, but it could happen.
uh, Muhammad, would you consider shipping corals internationally? Perhaps for large orders, could you make it possible to live in Saudi Arabia? So we do not have an export permit. And um, that is really like a very different business altogether because we live in Ohio. And for shipping exports to happen, you need to send it to um, like an international port of entry, which for us would be either be like Nashville, Tennessee, New York, or Chicago, or something like that. And then have a field agent there process that shipment. By the way, that is already a big deal to get it to one of those other cities. And then there's the whole process and paperwork of getting it overseas to some other place. That overseas person needs to have an import permit and also the infrastructure to process that thing because worst case scenario, um, it'll arrive in some country and there's like nobody even knows what to do with it. So it just gets stuck in customs for two weeks and that's not going to go well. So no, it, it's, it, is a, it is a very different business. So it is not something that we would be looking to do. Lindsay, uh, Lindsay Page, what do you think <clears throat> um, basically are the keys to being successful with keeping corals? Why do you think some people have better success than others? So I think that a lot of tasks in and around your tanks are kind of like flossing, like flossing your teeth. It's when you're with your dentist, you're always like, yeah, I floss. And you remember like, yeah, I flossed when I was 16. And I'm like almost 50 now. <laughs> it's like it's like that type of mentality happens where, you know, it's yeah, I, I totally have kept up with water changes and testing and this and that and all and the amount of effort that I was doing initially that I've kind of let slide. It's, it's like we, we kind of have like a way of lying to ourselves when it comes to maintenance. So sometimes it is really just a matter of doing the maintenance that's necessary and keeping up with it. I hesitate to say that it's like better equipment because it is possible to make less expensive equipment work. Um, the, the equipment to a large degree is here to make our jobs easier things like dosing pumps you could totally do this by hand but having it automated makes it more likely that you just won't forget i should vacuum my house more i don't so i get a roomba and it vacuums you know it's it's that sort of thing does it vacuum as well as me probably not but it was going to happen whereas if, if i was left to my own devices i probably wouldn't vacuum very often uh stuff like that so a lot of it does come down to like the maintenance end of the spectrum sometimes um a more experienced reef hobbyist will be able to identify problems better and start to to take action before things go really downhill like if i start to see something look a little worrisome I will know that, okay, it is time to like hit this really hard because what's going to happen is it's a lot of times these, these aquariums are slow moving ships. It's you're just seeing it veer off course. And if you start to try to write the ship now, it'll help you out a ton because once that thing has completely veered off course to try to get it back on track, it's going to be a lot more work. It's going to be a lot more challenging. So a lot of that preemptive stuff is at the first sign of danger, the first sign of an issue. That's like, you know, that's a very valuable skill is that observation. Um, the other thing is sometimes, um, when it comes to just being successful, yeah, a lot of it just comes down to maintenance, huh? 
sometimes it's luck. Like I, I, I talk all the time about people um, having kind of like unrealistic expectations about keeping pests out of a tank uh, because it's it's way more challenging than like a beginner would think. Like, you know, they think, well, I, and, I, and I, I hear it all the time. It's like, well, you could just quarantine. It's like, that sounds like you've never quarantined before. It, it sounds like something that you are like, you know, that like, that's the answer. It's like, it's a tool, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work. I know a lot of people that quarantine. We quarantine. And stuff still is able to make it through. Like there's there there's very few just magic bullets that take care of things. And especially at scale, it's very challenging. But in a small, isolated 40-gallon tank, and that's your only tank, and you just had like a handful of corals ever in your in your tank or a handful of fish ever in your systems, you could get lucky theoretically and just dodge it. But if you're in this hobby for any length of time with any length of real exposure to these things, you're going to get problems. And at that point, it is going to be about like problem solving and diligence. Do you collect enough rainwater to make 3,000 gallons per day? Um, well, we don't make 3,000 gallons per day. We make 1,000 gallons because that's how big our reservoir is. But if we have to like do a lot, um, no, it would probably deplete that pretty quickly. Our storage is like 10,000 gallons. We were looking at expanding it by um, triple to like 30,000 gallons at one point. Uh, but we can also just fill it up from our well also. So typically, if we're going through like a drought, because we actually had a drought this summer, we would have to fill it up from the well. Uh, but there's certain days where, yeah, like the entire rainfall would fill that cistern up no problem. <laughs> Drew Long 77. Oh my god, I'm replacing old exterior door jams with PVC and just listening. Almost drilled my hand when Dan imitated an overzealous reefer and said, settle down, where's your sink? <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. These are the thoughts that this is the thought process that you have to go through, you know, when you're doing these big projects. Uh, like the, the planning will really help you out. And that is coming from somebody that didn't do nearly enough planning for what we were doing here. I know that like, I mean, we, the, the stuff here turned out extremely well, all things considered. I'm really not complaining, but, um, I, I definitely think that uh, if like knowing what I know now, the next system that I put together would be an absolute banger. Like it, it would be so, so good. Like I've, I've got like a lot of ideas to make, um, to make stuff better. Sky and C 4k. How do those big Amazonas lights? So those are the Orphic Amazonas. Thinking of getting a few for a 43 inch deep tank. Uh, I do not envy the amount of work that a 43 inch deep tank would entail, but I have literally zero doubt that the Orphic Amazonas could burn the hell out of corals at the bottom of that tank. Like, it, it's one of those lights that are so strong, especially if you use like a narrower optic, that it could put a thousand par at the bottom of that tank. N not even worried. But uh, that's deep tank. Very deep. Not something that I would love to do. Yeah, I, I'm interested to... So I haven't like messed with like the new control system for those lights, but I... I would have to think that it would be a light years generational improvement over the, the lighting control that we are currently using with those lights. Uh, down the road, um, I might try some of those in the greenhouse and see how well they do because, you know, we could just use a wide, we're using narrow optics right now, but if we just grabbed like a wide optic 
and just to illuminate a 300 gallon Rubbermaid with a single light. I think it could absolutely handle that. It's, stuff like that would be kind of like a curiosity of mine. Bucky, how are you liking Footmaster casters? They are the best casters. Would you use them again? Absolutely. Yeah, they're the best. Like they're and I would oversize them because there's a quality difference in the ones that are made in Korea versus the ones that are made in Japan. So the 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 ones that the really good ones, and I think that that starts with the ones that can handle about like sixteen hundred pounds each, like those guys. Uh, they're they're made in Korea and they're awesome. We even have like the the ones that are like. Uh, are, are spring loaded and we use those for like photography equipment and stuff and those are amazing so yeah like the best casters we have ever used ever are footmaster and if you're like hyper hyper super duper crazy scared about using uh casters for an aquarium their biggest one is rated for 3,300 pounds per caster. I'm going to go ahead and guess when you have like, I don't know, six of these things for on, on a stand, your, your tank is not going to be heavy enough to make those things care at all. Like they're awesome. Sorry, I just got a thing. I had to check my phone real quick because uh, there are like one of my friends who moved out to Arizona is coming back for like the first time in like five years. So I guess I have that to look forward to, too. I haven't seen her in in a hot minute. So anyway, you guys, we are at Coral 215 and I believe uh there's like 30 ish. No, there's like, I think about 20 left, meaning there's about 10 minutes left in this show. And then it's college football time for me. Speaking of what are the college football scores? <laughs> While I look up uh, some college football scores, I'll give you guys some time to think up some last minute questions before I hit the eject button. And also eat some food. I'm getting hungry. Specifically, I was looking to see. Oh, good. So again, my my team plays later in the evening, so we're I haven't missed anything. Mm. Very interesting Texas Oklahoma game. Very interesting LSU Missouri. Oh, very cool. I should actually go and see a college football game in person. I haven't I haven't gone since undergrad <laughs> or something like that. It's been a while. Okay. Ali H been running four Hydra AI Hydras since 2017. I'm probably due for an upgrade and considering Reef Factory, Reef Flare, or Phillips Coral Cares. Any thoughts on them? Um, I don't know. I haven't tried the Reef Factory light. We own two Phillips Coral Cares. I like them. They need to be closer to the water. So right now we have them too high over some of our tanks. So the par value is not great. They're not really designed to be that high over the water. Having said that, they're nicely built. They are sealed. Uh, so they're very water resistant. That's good for the greenhouse. Not great because of you know the, the height issue that we're running into. They are freakishly heavy. They're like 50 pounds each because all the electronics and everything like that is built into them. It is freakishly heavy. So think very hard about how you're going to mount those things. 
Thank you so much for all the information. Love your presentation style and your wealth of knowledge. All the success. Thank you, Bucky. Appreciate it. Thank you for joining. James Bryan. I find that undesirable algae is more susceptible to hydrogen peroxide than macroalgae. Very likely. Very likely. I think ma the macroalgae tends to be um, resistant. I'll take clumps of macroalgae and dip them in 3%. Uh, I take my clumps of macroalgae and dip them in 3% hydrogen peroxide. Cool. However, some undesirable algae is a macroalgae. It's like a, like a thick turf almost that, uh, that can grow on your more desirable stuff. So like the red turf algae is, I mean, even then we do dip in hydrogen peroxide. It does kill it. We found that turbo snails was a better option for us. Mm, losing my throat, losing my voice. <clears throat> okay, guys. Well, I will wrap things up here. Thank you so much to our two corporate sponsors, Ecotech Marine and Polyp Lab. And thank you, of course, for joining uh, the Patreon folks that... Uh, that support the channel, Elaine Martinassi, Alan Jackson, Ann Lewis, Brandy Camp, Chuck Admire, Ernie Wallace, Greg, Greg Zimmerman, Harkins Aquatics, Jeremy Altman, AKA Two Please, Jordan Marty, Keith Singer, Kyle Jamison, Lisa Clow, Lacry Fine Art, Lynn Holt, Puddle Aquatics, Ryan Baker, Scott Williams, Skylar Korn, Sue Hemmins, Thomas Tarrant, and Tim Garner. And the YouTube members, Steven13, New Guy, The Frugal Reefer, Mike Downey, Keith Holland, Terry Kuhn, Stories Reef, Herb777, Justin Harden, and Ohio Ventures. Thank you all so much for your support. So, guys, we're almost done. What ratio of hydrogen peroxide to water do you use for dipping corals? Okay, so you want to be real careful with that, okay? A lot of corals are not going to like hydrogen peroxide. It is next level aggressive, okay? So I don't even know if I would, if I would recommend it, to be perfectly honest. The, the type of corals that I would dip are like zoas and nothing else. Like it's really aggressive really aggressive you could kill your coral by trying to solve some piddling issue okay uh really really light yeah whatever you were hoping to accomplish there might be a better way like let's say if, if nuisance algae get a turbo snail like that sort of thing um Frugal Reefer, glad I joined. This is absolute, uh, absolutely informative and a blast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So anyway, guys, hopefully you guys have a fun rest of the weekend planned. The next uh, the next live show, I believe is, uh, let me look it up real fast. We, you know, this is a, a one lifestyle improvement that we did. We actually started to make an entire schedule so i do know november 11th is the next show and that is the last show of the year november 11th you guys so mark your calendars um and we will hang out some more then so anyways guys that's about it we've got a couple more um more videos planned for you like i said be the fountain is going to come hang out and talk science with us um yeah we've got a couple of things in the works and like i said i'm working on a podcast studio partly because i i'm just hoping that if i build the entire studio set to do a podcast that'll actually hit record and you know and do the podcast that's like the important thing so i have to like make a, a list of folks that you know i want to invite and hang out with and and you know and, and talk reef aquariums with because there's um there's a few podcasts popping up but you know in general I, I i want like a closer connection to some of like these these industry folks and you know i want them to see this place and i was thinking like as far as like podcasty stuff not just 
things um, where we would talk about like issues and stuff like that in the in the aquarium hobby, but um, just like some stories, like some of the most interesting stuff are all like funny stories that people don't necessarily always get to hear because you know, like the, the, the folks that often are in this industry, you know, we've been in this for so long and we've seen some goofy things. We've seen some goofy behaviors, not just like in our aquariums, but just like, it's like people goofy because there's some colorful folks that are in this hobby. And uh, yeah, there's, I, I love hearing stories. So it's almost just like, I want to invite these people over just for story time with them, you know? Like sometimes it could just be like dealing with a horrible customer. I will relay a story that I heard from somebody else. And you know that it's not my story because it has to do with a fish that was sold. I heard a story where there was like a, you know, uh, a, a certain tang. It was like a rare tang that's expensive. And this person this customer who had you know they, they had bought from you know this this retailer before and you know it was like a regular customer i i'm assuming and he was asking okay is this fish three inches and um and so like you know, you know the the store was like yeah it's like i would say it's like between two and a half to three inches i mean we didn't take the thing out and measure it but yeah, it's going to be, you know, like I say, it's closer to three inches than it's closer to two and a half. But yeah, it's, I, I would say it's a three inch fish. Okay. He sells the fish. This customer calls up fuming, fuming mad. Okay. It's because of the size of the fish. He says, this fish isn't three inches. This fish is like three and three quarter inches. It's almost four inches and wants his money back. The owner of that company and the person and you know, actually taking the customer service call were like dumbfounded. It's, you do know that tangs grow, right? And a tang that's like three inches is not going to stay three inches. That is a very large animal. It's going to grow. And the fact that you got a larger fish than what was advertised, that's the problem here. So yeah, I, I, li I like to hear stories like that. It's, it's almost like a therapy session of sorts because <laughs> we all got them. We all got them. All right. Frugal Reefer, I'll be in Ohio to visit my daughter next month. I'd love to see the facility. Do you do tours for us regular folks? By appointment, uh, you have to email us and get you on the calendar. But yes, it is possible. Uh, let's see, Bucky, one last question. Would you ever go freshwater or planted? It's possible. Honestly, uh, I've got a lot of my plate. So like taking care of another tank, there has to be like a compelling reason for me to do such a thing. Like, that tank had better grant wishes at that point. So it might be a little bit of a tough call. Anyways, guys, thank you once again. I forgot how many like actual corals were on this thing. I think 238 is the last one. So let's see. Am I right? I think I'm right. I will see you guys next month, y'all. Take care and happy reefing.